Once again, please remember to enter and leave quietly as you can um, if you are leaving midway through a talk. Um, and don't forget to tweet. This is uh, Tilmas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome to my presentation. <laughs> yeah, save this for later, please. Uh, so I'm, I will be talking about Let's Encrypt and best practices. First, I'll start with a little introduction about me. I'm from Aachen, Germany. It's a small town uh, near the um, Belgium and Dutch border. Next biggest city is Cologne. And we are, for example, famous for our printen. It's a nice um, um, bakery thing that if you would like to try, you can try it here. Or later, I will uh, give some uh, to the Fedora booth because I'm also uh, involved with the Fedora project as a volunteer. Started a while ago as a packager and um, also patching all the things that I needed to uh, fix, for example, in the infrastructure. And recently, um, I'm involved in the release engineering process, mainly cleaning up packages. As a day job, uh, I'm, a um, I'm a penetration tester at Red Team Pen Testing. Um, and there I'm doing a lot of uh, security stuff. And therefore, I'm now here to talk to you about um, especially uh, transport layer security, more or less. So who of, you, who of you knows transport or TLS? OK, so most of you, for those who don't know it, it's a basic protocol that you need to secure a lot of services. For example, um, HTTP for websites or mail uh, services with um, IMAPS or SMTPS. And of course, you can also secure file transfers with it. And to use uh, TLS properly, you need TLS certificates. And if you don't have a right certificate, you see errors like this. And usually, you don't want that your customers or your uh, users are seeing these um, errors. So how do you get a certificate? For this, you need to go to a certificate authority. And the uh, CA uh, basically um, says that you have certain cryptographic keys and they belong to you so that everybody knows which keys to use to um, access your service properly. And what do you think? How many um, certificate authorities are currently um, stored directly on the Fedora system because uh, a system needs to know which certificate authorities exist. Uh, was there 100? 200? Yeah, 200 was right. So you get something. Get your own piece of print. <laughs> you can take it later. Yes, that's right. It's about 202, but these are only the so-called root certificate authorities because every um, certificate authority can also allow others to issue certificates in their name. And these are more or less uh, several thousand authorities. Nobody really knows how many there are because you don't need to register for them. But the, um, this graphic is from the uh, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and they just um, checked all certificates that they could find um, for which certificate authorities were issuing them. But so we have lots of certificate authorities. Why do we still have uh, connection errors like this one? So why are people not using certificates properly? Or why is there no TLS at all used? And there are even sites not enforcing TLS, even though they could be using uh, could be enforcing it. And when I ask uh, people why are they not using TLS, for example, if they are running a service, or even sometimes our customers don't actually enforce HTTPS or use it properly, there are several reasons um, that they tell me why they don't do it. And one reason they state is that's not fast enough. But as you can see from on istlsfastyet.com, the TLS has exactly one performance problem. It's not used widely enough, and everything else can be optimized. And if you're still wondering what you need to do, this website also contains a lot of information about how to optimize TLS. So performance is not really a proper reason. And for example, at Google, 
there's only about 1% of computational overhead for TLS, and everything else is used to um, provide the actual services. So this reason is not valid, there are, but, but still there are other reasons. For example, certificates still cost, uh, maybe cost too much money. Um, it's also not true in all cases because there are already some CAs that provide cheap certificates or at least, uh, or even free certificates, but sometimes only for um, normal users, not for businesses. Um, but still, um, if you invest a little bit of money, is there, uh, or want to like to invest a little bit of money in a certificate, are there other problems? Yes, it's also very hard to set up TLS properly. So for example, if you want to get a certificate, you first have to get an account at the certificate authority, then you have to validate your account, then you get instructions how to create a so-called certificate signing request, where you state what kind of certificate you would like to have. And then afterwards, you also have to prove that you control the actual server that you want to have the certificate. And after a while, you get the actual certificate, but then you also have to configure those servers properly to use the right certificate and also do it securely. And um, to fix all these problems, the Mon Mozilla Foundation, the EFF, and the University of Michigan started a project called Let's Encrypt a few years ago and they basically created a new certificate authority. And it's three important properties. It's free, automated, and open. And currently, it's already available, but still in public beta. So everything, it's, not, uh, it's not finished, and it's not, uh, not everything is already final. And I have to say, I'm not directly involved in the Let's Encrypt project. I'm just more or less a very interested observer. So if I tell you some details, it might be that the actual um, project might change in the future, or maybe decide to implement features in a different way than that I'll find, uh, find it out. I only had access to public resources to get this information. So what makes Let's Encrypt special? The first property is it's free and it's free to use completely. But this doesn't only mean that you get free certificates, you don't have to pay for them, but it also means that you can use the service of Let's Encrypt. And for example, there are about um, 20 or more um, uh, um, businesses who already include Let's Encrypt as a service in their service. So if you go to one of these hosting providers, you can just uh, enable TLS, and then you will get a certificate from Let's encrypt for free, and you don't have to worry about anything. It will just work. And for example, this has also an impact on other services like um, WordPress, and they are also planning to provide TLS for a lot of their blogs. So if you host your own domain there, you will just get a certificate and don't even have to decide about this. It's not final yet, but you can already see that they are getting the certificates. And it's not only free to use. Um, but it's also free as in free speech. So all information, uh, all uh, code from Let's Encrypt is free, to, um, is free software. You can have both the client and the server code that you can look into, and you can also use it. And the client uh, provides a Python API that you can use to implement your own client, and also the server pro uh, provides a defined API using the ACME protocol, which is a new standard uh, written by the Let's Encrypt project. And therefore, there are already different clients that you can use, and they all um, fulfill different needs. So for example, the official client is more or less the biggest client that does most of this stuff. And then you can see that there are also clients that try to minimize the feature set. And if you want to write your own client in any language, you also find libraries for uh, probably in the future every language. And there's even, and even if you still like the old way how certificate authorities work with the website, you can even use um, a self-hosting website which just implements the Let's Encrypt client in JavaScript. So you can download this website, run, open it in your browser locally, and you get all the steps as before. 
so everything is possible. But the, um, the official client is actually the one with the most fun, especially if you don't want to uh, spend a lot of time because it does all the things automatic. And uh, if you're using, for example, Fedora, you can already install it in the uh, latest release, and it's already packaged in EPL 7, but it's not quite finished yet. So uh, it, it's possible to get certificates, but not everything is already automated. So now we get to the next property, and it's also open. So you can uh, get all the details about the client, but you get also all information about what, uh, what Let's Encrypt does. So there's this project called Certificate Transparency, and it's basically a distributed system of several servers who all collect all information about certificates that are issued. And Let's Encrypt uses this to store information about all certificates that were ever issued by Let's Encrypt. So it's completely transparent if they, for example, by accident, issue a certificate for the wrong domain because of some vulnerability. Also, you can, for example, see that you, um, uh, a certificate that you are connecting to is really issued by the certificate authority. And this is already required, for example, for certain certificates to make it sure that um, the browser Chrome displays them correctly. But um, not all certificate authorities use it already. And let's encrypt, uh, and I forgot, this is uh, also a website not provided by Let's Encrypt, but I think Komodo. It's called crt.sh for certificate search. And there you can search for all these certificates. And Let's Encrypt wants to go even, wants to become even more open. They also plan to publish all the logs about the interaction with the client, from the client with the server, so you can even uh, comprehend why um, uh, how users are authenticated to the Let's Encrypt server, and everything is transparent. And now the final, but the only problem is that um, Let's Encrypt is still in beta, so there are still things that need to be improved and need to be added, and there are also some restrictions in place. For example, since everything is automated, you can only get five certificates within seven days per domain, and also each certificate can only contain uh, up to 100 host names. So depending on your use case, this might restrict you a little bit. And actually, um, and there's another problem, uh, or, uh, well, there's another restriction, and this is that every certificate is only valid for 90 days. So this means um, if you really want to renew every certificate at the latest moment, you, only, you can only have about 60 certificates per domain, because otherwise you won't be able to renew every certificate. And, but usually if you have a service that requires a lot of domains, um, it might be that uh, the restriction does not need to be for the domain, but for a so-called um, domain for a public suffix because you do not only have server, um, registered subdomains, for example, fedoraproject.org, but you could also have domains for dynamic DNS services. And then you can get these domains added to the public suffix list, and then the restriction about the, or the rate limiting only applies to these subdomains. So you can, uh, so each domain, for example, below these domains can have up to five certificates uh, within seven days. And this is also, this is not only used, um, or the, the primary use case of this is not Let's Encrypt, but actually you should you do this already um, if you're in this situation, because this list is also used to separate different domains that have uh, different security properties. So for example, in browsers, you don't want to have a one uh, DIN DNS subdomain access cookies from another DIN DNS subdomain. And the only way that a browser can know that it should separate these domains is if it's uh, properly stored in the public suffix list. There are also some other restrictions that Let's Encrypt currently has that will probably not change in the future. So for example, there are a different kind of validated certificates 
uh, and in an organization validated certificate, you also have um, additional information about who the certificate belongs to and in extended validation even more. And this is something that Let's Encrypt cannot um, do because it's an automated process and then you don't have the possibilities for, to, for example, validate that is um, a certain organization that requests the certificate. Also, code signing is out of scope for Let's Encrypt and they decided to not sign IP addresses at the, at the moment, especially because you still have a lot of users that use dynamic, DN, uh, dynamic IP addresses. And currently, it's also not possible to get certificates for military certificates, uh, so for military domains, but this should not be a problem for us. There are some features that are not yet available, but are planned for the future. For example, wildcard certificates are currently not possible. So you have at least currently you have to get a certificate that contains all the host names that you want to use it for. And the problem here is again that when you do it, when you want to have a wildcard certificate um, created automatically, you need to make sure that you really control, uh, you really have a person that is allowed to get a wildcard certificate. And for example, you don't want people to get wildcard certificates for all the DNS host names, but uh, the current but that it's not easy to verify this properly. And um, as you probably know, if you've ever seen a Python UTF uh, Unicode encode error, um, international domain um, of writing for proper encodings is also hard. Therefore, international domain names are currently not possible. And elliptic uh, curve cryptography is also currently not implemented, but planned. And it might be that you can use um, let's encrypt also for secure mail encryption with SMIME in the future, but still something that's not done yet. And currently, um, Let's Encrypt is al already trusted by most um, systems, but there are still some systems that might not um, accept Let's Encrypt certificates and valid certificates. For example, Java might not know the actual root CR that's used to sign Let's Encrypt certificates. Old Android systems don't support it. Um, and in BlackBerry, it's currently, a pro uh, it's currently going to be included. Pro maybe the biggest problem might be still Windows XP, and it um, has actually a problem with um, if it's not updated enough with the kind of, um, kind of signing algorithm that's used in Let's Encrypt certificates. But this is um, handled by a new service pack. But the other problem is that Let's Encrypt is currently using it's currently a subordinate certificate authority, and it contains this restriction for .mil or military uh, host names. And, therefore, uh, and this is something that Windows XP doesn't seem to handle right now, so it just uh, does not accept the certificate. But this might go away if um, Let's Encrypt gets included into other, um, uh, might, uh, maybe it doesn't go away for Windows, so skip that. Um, so if you have now a proper certificate and uh, want to use it, uh, and you have st um, still some things to do to make sure that you're doing this correctly. So for example, if you have any links, make sure that they are already using HTTPS because otherwise you might already might have set up a proper server that provides HTTPS, but nobody is using it if you still have links that don't use HTTPS. If you have a lot of links that you need to update for this and don't have the time yet, there's a feature called Upgrade Insecure Request that you can set in your HTTP browsers and then make sure that the browser automatically updates insecure requests. But this is still not the best possibility. There's also another option that's called strict transport security. And this basically says uh, the browser that a certain domain should be accessed over HTTPS for a certain amount of time after, you access, after the browser accesses once via HTTPS. So this makes sure that a user cannot even access the website anymore insecurely, um, except for the first actually request ever to this website. And even this can be 
mitigated because Google maintains a so-called HSTS preload list and you can add your domain to this one and then the browser already knows which domains will always, uh, should always be used via HTTPS. But you should do this only after carefully testing that everything is working because once you're on this list, it's really hard to stop using HTTPS. So if you still have one subdomain that's not actually uh, working well with HTTPS but requires plain HTTP, you have a problem if you have are uh, in the um, strict transport security list. And for example, in the Fedora project, we are working uh, several years now to mi uh, migrate all services from HTTP to, plain, uh, to proper HTTPS with strict transport security. So now, if you have um, the proper certificate and you have it configured properly, there's still another problem because uh, for example, Let's Encrypt might be a very good and secure certificate authority, but there are thousands of other certificate authorities. And who knows what all these names have in common? Yes, yeah, so you also get uh, some printing afterwards. And exactly, so these are former certificate authorities or sometimes also still operating certificate authorities but not trusted anymore that were either hacked or contained, for example, the certificate or, or were included on uh, notebooks so that everybody had access to the private keys of the certificate authority or they issued certificates not to the proper um, owner of a domain. And you can also um, avoid this kind of problem by um, using public key pinning. So initially, the certificate authority certifies which public, which encryption key to use for your domain, but you can do the same with an HTTP header. And then the browser um, knows which uh, keys to use for future requests. And if there's uh, any other key used, it will deny the request. Or if you want to uh, experiment with it first, you can also make the browser just report problems with um, false keys. And this is, for example, the feature that made it even possible to identify all these problems with certificate authorities. And there are probably even more certificates out there that are not in use by the proper domain owner, but nobody really knows because uh, it's not properly reported. And if you're doing this, you have to make sure that your keys are properly stored. So and you have a backup key. For example, if you now lose access to one encryption key and all browsers think that's the one key that you need to use to access the website, then the browsers will not be able to access the website anymore. And the uh, system even mandates that you should have at least one second backup key that you can already specify, but of course to make sure that this one is not compromised at the same time as the primary key, make sure that's properly hidden. And there are still even other options that you have to um, set to make sure that TLS is properly used. So for example, you, can, you have to make sure that you also use the right encryption after your certificate is set and Mozilla um, allows you to set up, um, to get the proper con configuration depending on your needs because if you have to, ex for example, um, support all systems, it might be that you have to lower your security, but if you have a modern system like Fedora, you can even make it better. So if your clients are using the modern system. And there are so many settings that I cannot get into detail about them, but there's one page um, for, by Qualys, the SSL Labs, where you can test your website and you get information about what's all good and what's bad. But eventually, the good news is that the Let's Encrypt client will support all these settings and make sure that um, you can select the security level that you would like to have. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation I would like to thank everyone who allowed me to use their pictures. I would also like to thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And even if, you, if there is something that you didn't like, please make sure that you fill out the feedback form, because it's really appreciated as a speaker to get any kind of feedback. For example, last year I only get, got 
one feedback mail, and I heard that the speaker with the most feedback mails got only 10. So it's not um, so good for a speaker to not get feedback. Thank you very much, and I'm now here to answer any questions. Okay, so the question is how long will it take to learn everything required to set up a website, for example, running Nginx to use HTTPS properly. So if you're using, so if the um, official Let's Encrypt client is finished and it already, uh, and it will support Nginx eventually, then it's just, uh, it just takes a few seconds because you just install the client and run it and then it will get the certificate and also update the Nginx configuration. So. This will be the best case. Um, if you don't know everything, th there's already a lot of documentation about it, but uh, I can't really estimate how long it will take for you. But at least getting the certificate will, will be uh, very easy because you can also use the client um, just to get the certificate in a few seconds without it having, um, when it does not already um, uh, support your configuration. Yes, so the question was, if you just have to go download the client and tell it something about your configuration, and yes, you only have to tell it, uh, you might only have to tell it which domains you actually are using, unless it is also possible for the client to get this information from your configuration. So you get uh, something afterwards, just come on. So the question is how easy is it to automate the renewal of certificates and it is as well very easy because you can just run the official client in a cron job like every 60 days or even um, maybe more often in case you skip some ones and it will verify whether or not it needs to renew the certificate and then do it and it's currently recommended to do that after 60 days. Uh, the question is if you can sign subordinate uh, certificates with Let's Encrypt, and this is currently not possible. Uh, the question is if there are plans, and I don't know of any plans because, um, yeah, I think uh, you have the same problem currently, at least with um, wildcard certificates, because you ha would like to delegate trust for a certain unknown large set of domains and this is really hard to do it properly in an automated way. Um, the, the, the machines that generate the certificates, etc., are they, I guess they are located in the United States. Um, second question, is the server side part of Let's Encrypt also open source or only the cloud? Uh, so the first question was uh, about the location of the servers uh, that issue the certificates. Um, whether they are only in the US. Um, I'm not quite sure yet where they are located, properly in the US, but there are, are plans to locate them at different, to have um, val validation from different um, locations on the internet to make sure that uh, there's not a local attacker directly near the um, computing center of Let's Encrypt. And the other question was, uh, um, is, uh, so the client side part Oh yeah, okay. I, Okay, so the question was uh, whether the server code is also open source, and yes, it is. It's written in Go, and you can use it to set up your own certificate like Let's Encrypt. For example, there was a question at another conference about whether or not it would be possible to sign .onion addresses with Let's Encrypt, and this is currently not possible, but you could use uh, or the set up the infrastructure yourself and then use like a dedicated certificate authority for Tor hidden services.
Okay, the question was, since it's an automatic process, what uh, is there, um, what is done to prevent uh, someone from register, registering an address for Google? So the, even though it's automated, there's still a check like classical certificate authorities do. And for example, you have to make sure that you have a certain value in your, um, available on your document route, which uh, Let's Encrypt uh, tells you a secret value and, uh, or a random value, and then if you provide it, then Let's Encrypt uh, will get it and then more or less know that the certificate is, um, that the domain is yours. It's also possible to use uh, DNS, so you have a dedicated DNS entry uh, where you have to um, use um, this random value, which makes it easier if you have a lot of domain names that you need to register. And um, there's also some very interesting thing planned called um, proof of possession, where you have um, you can use old certificates, or if you have a certificate already, you can make use this one to prove that you were, uh, are the actual owner of a certificate because it was used already. Uh, but I think this is uh, still planned. And this is also something um, where you can use certificates from all other certificate authorities to have more or less like a trust on first use process. So you once got a certificate and then it's more or less locked down to all people having access to this certificate or all certificates issued afterwards. Uh, so the question was, how is certificate revocation handled? And I believe there's probably a regular CRL. There's also a uh, signed OCSP responder, which is an interactive method to revoke certificates. And the other question was whether expired certificates are put in the CRL. And this is actually um, the good thing about the short validity of the certificates, because you don't need to put them in the CRL. They are already invalid because uh, they are expired. So this also makes, makes it easier for Let's Encrypt to um, keep the workload on the UC, OCSP responder uh, small because they have only uh, signed uh, information about the um, certificates that are still valid and that were issued within the last 90 days. So the question was if there's a defense against re registering uh, domain names that look like um, official domains. And there's um, a list of domains, I think maybe the top 100 uh, Alexa list or also a list about um, financial institutes and other high value domains. And it's currently impossible to re register domains that are too similar to them or um, are more or less the same, and this. Um, but this is also the, also something that's currently a little bit um, developing. For example, it was possible for some people to register domains that looked too similar to um, to a banking domain, but not by uh, not by intention, but more or less by accident. So they have a domain uh, that's uh, similar, and they got the first certificate, but then later they couldn't renew because the restrictions became more um, restrictive. Service seems like a really ripe target for scammers and stuff like that. I was wondering if you were aware of any other abuses or um, you know, malicious attacks or something like that that this stuff, service has suffered. Okay, so the question was whether I know any attacks that, um, or, or any phishing site that's already using Let's Encrypt. I think there were some phishing sites using Let's Encrypt, but Let's Encrypt is also um, using the safe browsing technique used by browsers to identify malicious websites to also make sure that they don't issue um, certificates for bad domain names. So the question was, why are certificates only valid for 90 days? So there are several advantages um, of doing this. The one is that the workload for Let's Encrypt is reduced because to make um, to use this OCSP service, which, which allows it to verify whether certificates were revoked or not, all the certificates need to be signed. And since it's an automated service, uh, Let's Encrypt 
could have millions of certificates that they need to handle, and with these 90 days, they have a little bit of restriction in there. Also, it makes sure that if you have a compromise of uh, private keys of a certificate, for example, with heartbleed, then you only have to worry.